it's MC Devi here. You are listening to the Beat Beat Podcast, exposing the truth as we see it. This is the podcast where a son, a mother of one, and a grandmother of three open up each other's eyes to the matrix. Look at the modern day world from the perspective of three different generations. Follow, laugh, and brilliantly analyze the tragic comedy we know as the human experience. Music you are listening to is by my late and great grandfather Sadun El Beati. May he rest in peace. Yo, 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 it's your host, MC Devi, with another episode of the Beat Beat. I'm joined by my two lovely co hosts, the Reverend Summer Albeati, over there on my far side, and closer to me, we hey. have the matriarch, Barbara Albeati. Um, Hello. I'm a little sick, and so I kind of sound a little weird. I'm sorry for that. But we do have two guests from Citizens Climate Lobby. Over here we have Mark Tabert. He was he is on the Citizens Climate Education Board and has started seven chapters of Citizens Climate Lobby. And we also have Alexa Foster, uh, who is the coordinator for the state of California and works with two Congress members, uh liaisons coordinator. Isn't that correct? Right? You know, I'm one of many coordinators in California because oh. we're such a big state, but yeah. um, I am the coordinator that um, kind of helps organize the chapter liaisons to Congress people. Okay. It probably doesn't mean a lot to most people, but um, the idea is that we have a lot of people in the state coordinating all the chapters because there's so many chapters here. Okay. Nice. All right. That's cool. good news. That is good. Um, so... I'm just going to ask you a couple questions. You mentioned you biked, right? Right. Why Why do you bike? Um, I bike because I like to exercise and take mm-hmm. care of myself. And I enjoy biking. I've My longest trip is to Houston, Texas from Orange County. <gasps> wow. And, and I've done a long desert trek of about a thousand miles uh, one time. And I've done the coast of California twice with friends. Really? Mm-hmm. How does biking make you feel? Biking, you know, biking is the best way to travel I think there is because um, when I went to Houston for 21 days, I didn't think we'd be talking about my biking trip, but this is great. (laughs) When I went to Houston for 21 days, it was fascinating because you got to meet so many people. Every time you had a meal and you're there on your bicycle, you come into these little towns and you always had interesting conversations. with other bikers or no, no, with the people in that town. Um, I took a trip. I sailed to Hawaii one time, mm. and that took me twenty-one days too. The same amount of time, by coincidence. Mm. And I had a lot of fun doing that. I always wanted to go to sea and see if I could do that, and, and so I did that. But comparing the two, biking versus sailing, I could go biking tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Sailing, you'd have to sort of twist my arm to do it again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if I could go around the world, I might go on that kind of a journey. But just to do a trip on the on the sailboat doesn't have the the hold it used to have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's something I wanted to do one time, and I did. Now that's interesting. But biking biking's always interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's also interesting that you mentioned biking and sailing because those are two very low carbon um, emission activities, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So, do you do that partially? to lower carbon emissions, you know, sell to Hawaii, or do you do it also? I definitely, I definitely don't do it. I have a very low carbon footprint, but I fight the idea that carbon footprints make a difference at this point. We're past the point where carbon footprints on an individual basis means anything. Really? Yes. Mm. And that's according to Bill McKibben from 350.org. That's according to Michael Mann, a very famous scientist who did the, uh, He's famous for the hockey stick graph that shows what's happening in the environment, like Al Gore's mm-hmm. graph in his film. Mm-hmm. We need everybody in the world to do something. We can't just depend on good, good-hearted people doing the right thing. So I actually um, 
try not to talk about. I try to talk about the carbon footprint just the way I just said to you. Mm. So we need a collective effort from everybody to see change. We really need a government election uh, effort at this point. Government is supposed to be our way of coming together to to pass laws and legislation to get, to get things done that can cross international borders. And that's a bill we have in Congress right now that does that very thing. Mm. So at what point did the carbon footprint not matter? Well, the truth is, it goes back a long way. Um, when, when climate change became an issue, we had just had two big successes with something called cap and trade. Cap and trade is what we have in California right now for carbon. Mm -hmm. But before that, cap and trade was used for acid rain and for ozone. It was very effective in reducing ozone and reducing acid rain. But the reason it was effective is because there were very few sources of acid rain of where it started. And so you could, tr you could, you could track those people real easily, the industries that made acid rain and the industries that produced ozone. Mm -hmm. So you could set a cap and say, okay, this year is a max you can do. Next year it's gonna be lower. And you force industry to, to lower or change their technology to lower their emissions of the harmful thing. So when climate change came along, the environmentalists took over and really sort of made a mistake. And I'm not criticizing anybody because it's very understandable. You know, we just had success with things, mm -hmm. but carbon is different than those things because everybody's producing carbon. The five of us sitting in this room right now are producing carbon. Mm -hmm. The clothes we wear, the food we eat, the, the rug on the floor, the building we're in, if you spend the penny, you just burn carbon. We have no idea where our carbon is coming from. People think your carbon's in your lights, your heating and cooling, and your gasoline. The truth is that's 36% of our personal carbon footprints. The other 64% and the other things I just named, that's some of the things I named. So if I go out to a fancy dinner mm -hmm. and I buy French wine and I eat escargot and mm -hmm. I'm burning carbon. Um, so it turns out that poor people don't burn much carbon. Really? Interesting. You know, I used people, well, I'm getting ahead of myself because we have a bill that's going to be, if we talk about the bill that I want to talk about today with you guys. Okay. Um, but let me ask you guys the three, the three of you a question. Uh huh. Since, since we, this works both ways, right? Yeah. <laughs> are all okay. of you, are you, all of you alarmed about climate change? Are you concerned about climate change? Do you have any questions about it still? Concerned about the reality of climate alarm. change, you mean? Right. About questions the reality about of the science. Is the science something that alarms you? Do you think you have to do it right now? Or do you think we have a little bit more time? No, oh, I think no. we have to do it right now. Right now. I, um, my, uh, my alma mater from um, undergrad is from UC Irvine. And the professor at UC Irvine um, discovered the hole in the ozone layer. So when I was going to school way back when um, at UCI, there was a lot of talk about, you know, um, especially because I studied in the social ecology, school of social ecology, um, a lot of talk about um, climate and, and climate change. You saw people were, you know, already... Um, we were being socialized into carrying our water bottles, refillable water bottles everywhere. So, um, so I've been concerned about the climate for um, a long time, and now it, I'm uh, definitely alarmed. So you're referring to Sherry Rowland, uh, the late Professor Sherry Rowland, who discovered the hole in the ozone. By the time you were in college, because of his work and his finally being taken seriously, the hole in the ozone was beginning to repair itself. And then he became more interested in global warming, I believe. Mm -hmm. So we have three generations here. So I didn't hear Devin answer. Yeah, I was going to say, yes, Devin. Yeah, I was gonna like, I'm interested to know if there's any difference in how the, the different generations in this room see climate change yes. and the urgency. Well, um, I think definitely the, uh, us younger generations mostly have a lot of resentment mm -hmm. towards the older generations. Mm -hmm. 
because they didn't take care of this problem faster and we're having to deal with it in very uh, personal ways. You know, it isn't just um, like, oh, climate change. It affects a lot of us to scale to the to the point where, you know, the loneliness epidemic in this country, especially with young people and depression, all that stuff. A lot of it is, you know, climate change, too. Mm. You know, isn't just personal stuff throughout your life. Climate change is personal to us because it determines the life we're going to have for ourselves in the future and for, you know, our kids and our grandchildren. How, and how do you see, how do you see your life being affected by climate change? By climate change? Yes. Well, just like over the years, for example, it's getting hotter outside, right? When I was younger, the heat wasn't so much of a big deal during summertime. Like I went to the pool and I, you know, sometimes I wouldn't wear sunscreen and I'd be fine. But now it's like, it's like really hot during summer, for example. And then, you know, we have all these projections and we're overloaded with data through media. And so we look at climate change as almost a dystopian environment mm -hmm. that's how we look at it and that's how we you know believe we're being affected and in fact um i go hiking up here there's a hiking trail near our house and i used to go every morning and every time i'd go up there i could see the smog layer because we we got up to that height you hike up there and I just see the smog there. And that's just, you know, like we were under that smog all the time, you know, mm -hmm. and it affects us. We may not know it does, but it does. Do you feel like you're making life changes or life decisions differently because of climate change? Yes. I, I think um, over the years, our family has developed habits that are just habitual at this point when mm -hmm. it comes to, you know, uh, climate change. So, yeah, we do things, you know, to, to lower our carbon, our carbon footprint, our individual carbon footprint, which, you know, yeah, I just heard from Mark is not as important at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's interesting because I think, you know, people who are um, in midlife are adjusting by trying to address their carbon footprint, mm. you know, because at least it feels like you're not indifferent to the problem. Um, and uh, Citizens Climate Lobby is very much about um, kind of communal effort um, on the political side. But I think young people are also thinking ahead and, and literally planning their lives differently and thinking, hmm, you know, what is the best career or what skills should I have to be capable of of you know surviving or or doing my best in the coming um climate crisis and uh, you yeah. know should i have children and you know mm -hmm. where should i live is it safe should to live near the to coast Michigan? or that yeah. yes mm -hmm. so so it, the the level of um kind of disruption i think is so much greater for younger people and um devon's kind of right at that you know the edge of making those decisions so i was just kind of curious um but I guess you're also saying it kind of affects mental health. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, and on a macro level, yeah, I, I'm i probably going to go into environmental science, um, you know. And also, I'm, I'm slowly becoming more and more minimalist. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go in my room right now, it's just like a bed in there in a mini fridge. <laughs> mm -hmm. But... Uh, like there's no furniture anymore so in terms of how life is being planned out 100 percent like um I, i'm not content with sitting at home um or sitting like like being in the like a town and not going out into uh places where 
that like need help with uh climate Mm -hmm. like i will probably go to the amazon for example to help with climate Mm -hmm. so in terms of a macro scale of how i plan to live for the next maybe 10 years yeah definitely so it sounds like climate's really become sort of an organizing principle of your life yeah Mm -hmm. Devin was Devin uh, started the sustainability club at his school, um, and um, the whole school, the science department, did a um, a study of the collective carbon footprint of everyone um, in order to uh, in order to educate everybody and and the other students the families um that came and and saw the presentation and um and his group um were responsible for coming up with a solution to reduce the carbon footprint collectively so um devin i think really started by taking environmental science in high school really started to become transformed on a deeper level than maybe some of his peers and um i even saw a change in his the way he his eating habits his concern about health and nutrition um and i think uh the idea that he has really thought about what is the future going to bring and he can't sit still and not just help so um yeah um and i was different though because i went to um i took like a really young age at uci i Mm -hmm. was part of a program and climate was very much imprinted onto all of us there yes and science was very much imprinted and during that time i was very much a scientist and so i did start the uh sustainability club at school but a lot of kids did not care as much as i did and that was really uh disheartening uh for me as a a young individual because you you might want to tell us the name of your school oh emerson choice academy formerly el dorado emerson so it's a private school it's smaller it's also an international school so you know that might have had something to play with it a lot of kids just not really caring as much um so yeah there's all that that stuff do you have an idea of why some kids don't care i think it's uh they've become apathetic Mm. to the idea of climate change and there's a lot of uh lost hope when it comes to climate change especially with the younger generations and uh you know it gets dark for a lot of people so i think a lot of them just like why what's the point what can we do what can i do uh, and you know teenagers have a lot of insecurities that's a, a big thing mm-hmm. and that's uh partially why the they're very depressed and lonely and all this stuff there's just a lot of insecurities that mm-hmm. float around so well maybe that's a good um kind of segue into talking about what citizens climate lobby is is doing um because it's one of you know several groups that well lots of groups are now activated but um as mark was saying before um ccl has really worked hard to come up with um a a practical way of of coming up with solutions because there's a lot that you can do that doesn't really have much impact and the um kind of the consensus that uh we've come to working sort of with economists and with scientists and working with people who are on both the the right and the left side of the political aisle and everything in between is that it's going to come down to a political solution um and that 
it's it's really kind of beyond individual efforts. And so this bill that we're here to talk about, among other things, is a bill that um, tries to reduce carbon um, really dramatically through a carbon pricing mechanism. And I'm, I think that maybe that's something that Mark could talk more about it because he's really well versed on this bill, um, if you guys are interested. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, CCL, we call them CCL, Citizens Climate Lobby. We'll, yeah. we'll use those terms, all, the CCL all the time. CCL started 12 years ago, um, right at the time that the Obama bill failed. Um, the, the Clean Energy Act? The, no, the, the, clean power. The, the first time they tried to pass a cap and trade system. Oh, okay. When he first got elected. Um, and actually, we were we had founded our group before that, so we were working like everybody else on cap and trade at a national level, and then it failed. And at that point, the leaders of our group looked around for a solution that could pass Congress, and we discovered carbon pricing of a simple a simple kind of carbon pricing. But Summer, I have to say one thing. My carbon footprint is very low. I don't eat meat. Mm -hmm. I, my car gets 54 miles a gallon. I don't use a clothes dryer. I hang my clothes out to dry, which I love doing, by the way. <laughs> uh, so I love, and I do, you know, I, I'm very aware of my carbon footprint because I want to walk the talk because it's just part of my, who I am. Yeah. yeah. But I'm just trying to say, if I go out and I preach to people and tell them, watch your carbon footprint, I'm really not helping the cause. Mm -hmm. That's that's the point. Anyway, um, the founder of our organization uh, discovered a simple kind of carbon tax in a meeting in Washington, and he met Dr. James Hansen, who was a NASA scientist, who was the first scientist to talk to Congress about climate change publicly back in George the first, George Bush the first was in office. And uh, he's one of the advisors now to our group and has been with us since, since the beginning. Mm. So carbon pricing, let me explain what we, what our bill does so that you understand when I talk about carbon pricing, what it means. We put a price on carbon. We say we. The United States would put a price on carbon when it comes out of the ground and enters the economy. Mm. So at the well, the mine, and the port, you put a price on carbon. Who pays that? The oil, coal, and gas companies pay it. Mm. And who gets the money? Well, the government gets the money. But according to the bill that we're that we support that we've written actually, the money all goes back to us on an equal basis. So every American gets a, a dividend every month, and what that does is protect the poor people and the middle class people from rising fossil fuel prices, because as soon as you put a price on carbon fuels, the price of carbon fuels are going to rise. So your gasoline goes up, your electric bill goes up, your heating and cooling bill goes up. Mm -hmm. It all goes up. But the bill is written in such a way that the poorer you are, you make profit. In fact, about the bottom 40% of our economic world in the United States would actually make a profit on this deal. And as it goes, as you get more and more people up climbing the income ladder, they start to feel the price, but they're the people that have a lot of money and spend a lot of money. So the top 20%, economically speaking, those people, they they're the ones that are paying the carbon tax in effect mm. through their purchases because they're also the biggest users. But that's because they're burning the carbon. Right. They're mm -hmm. flying airplanes. They drive speedboats. They do whatever rich people do. Mm -hmm. right. And again, as I said earlier, whenever you're spending money, you're burning carbon. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're a minimalist, like you were talking, yes, um, you're not spending a lot of money. You're not burning a lot of carbon. So. So there's our, our plan. The basics is we, we tax at the well, the mine, the port. We put the money in the government's hands. They distribute it on a monthly basis to protect the poor and middle class. And then um, we make sure that the other countries in the world follow our lead. Mm. So there's an adjustment at the border. This is legal according to the World Trade Organization. We put a price on carbon and we treat our companies a certain way. We can demand that other countries treat their carbon situation the same way we do. And if they don't, then they pay an import tariff to our country, to us, if they want to import products to us. Well, it so happens, we don't, we truly believe that we don't have, we don't really have to use that. We just, the threat of it's enough. Mm 
Mm-hmm. The rest of the world is waiting for the United States to do something on climate change. Yes. And this is something that's renowned around the world as being the right answer is to put a price on carbon. So if the United States does it, and nobody else can do it like we can do it, and the reason for that being true is because we buy so much junk. Mm. We yeah. buy yeah. everything from China. We buy everything from India. Yes. We're the importers. So if we set a standard in our country and we demand they do the same or pay a fee, they're going to follow our lead. Mm. Because it comes down to, do they want to pay us or do they want to pay themselves? So if they put their own fee on their own carbon production, then they at least <coughs> will benefit from the fee mm. rather than having it go into a tariff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Every year, the price goes up. So our fees, the, the bill's fee, not ours anymore, it's, mm-hmm. it's now the bill. Yeah. The bill's fee is $15 the first year and next year 25 and then 35 up to $10 a year. And if it doesn't go up fast enough, according to the emissions, as emissions fall, we can measure that. Then they raise the price more than the ten dollars, and there's a there's a formula for that. I can't mm. recite that. Now, usually at this point, if I'm speaking to groups, I get questions. Mm-hmm. Does this make sense? The carbon bill that I've described. Do you have any questions? Um, I I think I my understanding is that companies will naturally want to lower their carbon footprint. Um, because of being charged, correct? You're, you're, Summer makes yes. the best point that I forgot to make. Okay. And the point is this. We're protected by the dividend as individuals, but companies are never protected. So if I'm manufacturing umbrellas mm-hmm. and I'm competing with four other umbrella manufacturers in the United States and Europe and wherever, and I say to myself, well, my, my fuel price right now is about 10% of my expenditures. Mm. And next year, that's going to go up if I keep using fossil fuels the way I am. And I'm going to start looking closer because I want to compete with my umbrella manufacturers who are going to be doing the same kind of thinking. And they're all going to be looking for ways to conserve or to power themselves differently. And there's a myriad of ways. The people at UC Davis that have studied this, UC Davis and Stanford, there's been a study Mark DeLucci and Mark, there's another Mark. There are two Marks. DeLucci is one of them. Mm -hmm. And the other Mark, I can't think of his name. Pretty famous study. They said we could be off fossil fuel in 20 years Mm -hmm. if the market gets a clear message that the price of fossil fuel is going to rise. You talked about the ozone Mm -hmm. that the professor, who I heard speak before he passed away. (laughs) Um, And I lost my train of thought, but... um, Oh. You're talking about the ozone and uh, how companies are not protected from the fee, and so oh, they're being yes, pushed to be more the efficient. because the ozone, the companies producing the ozone and the acid rain, they said, oh, this is going to break our bank. We're never going to be able to do this. We're going to go broke if we have to do this. Yeah. It was all baloney. Yeah, um, that's not true. And we really have no idea of what's ca- capable. Australia had a carbon tax for a short time. Australia did. Mm. Politics, politics changed that and they got rid of it. But when they had the carbon tax for half a year or so, emissions fell by 6% in the first quarter. Wow. And you know why? Because people can make immediate changes. Yes. If India, if you talk to Indian prime minister about carbon footprint in India, he shows you a picture of the United States in New York at midnight. Yeah. Mm. How we waste, you know, mm. they're not doing that. Yeah. Mm. Not like we do. Yes. They might have big cities that are lit up at night too. Mm-hmm. But his point is America is so wasteful of carbon, of, of fossil fuel. Yeah. Right. I, you can't expect other countries to um, to fall on the line if we won't even fall on the line, right? Right. Because right. Mm-hmm. Right. we're such we're big, not the good example. big players yes. in this yeah. issue. Yeah. One of the things that um, I was really interested in learning about uh, in terms of the carbon bill's impact is that um, it really has a beneficial impact on uh, innovation too, because you know, there's, I think a lot of people are hoping that we can innovate our way out of uh, climate change. Mm. And, you know, I, I, I'm in that group to a certain extent that I think innovation is going to be very helpful and necessary because it's going to take everything. And one of the dynamics that happens with the uh, carbon bill is that as the price of fossil fuels goes up, 
there's a lot more market demand for alternatives and suddenly R&D yes. money becomes available because uh, the private sector can make their money back if they actually put their investment money into new technology. So mm -hmm. it, it really has a, you know, a widespread impact on pushing us towards alternatives. This is a conservative solution. It's a market solution. And the problem is not our carbon footprint. The problem is it's an energy problem. We rely on something that's real dirty. And we've always paid the cost of that dirtiness in the past. People in the East Coast that breathe coal, they die. We don't die so much in California from coal, but they do back East. Mm. And worldwide, it's a huge problem. Who pays that price? So people pay that price. People die. People get sick. People get asthma. That's an externality of burning fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. And we've always paid that. Public has always paid that. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, now we're adding on the cost of carbon of climate change on top of those other externalities. And so we're simply saying, okay, fossil fuel, you're dumping stuff on the atmosphere for free today, but tomorrow you won't. Yeah. I can remember living in, <coughs> in Chicago uh, in the 60s. And um, at that point, we still, this is before the hippie revolution, um, at that point, we still dressed up to go downtown shopping, so white gloves and a hat, and we would go down <laughs> to the Loop to shop. My husband and I were both students in Chicago at the time. Um, and I would come home, and there would be a smudge of soot on my face, my hat, my gloves, and people these days are trying to put forth the notion that coal is clean. It's never been clean. Mm. It's never been clean. You, there are soot particles in the air constantly when yeah. you use coal. Yeah. The, the way that we handle energy now is that there are a lot of people who are relative winners because you know, you, if you don't get sick and you don't die, you're relatively a winner. But if you are one of the people who, who gets a disease and becomes chronically ill or passes away, you're the loser. And there really has been no way to, to balance out the cost. And so, so this is, um, you know, one of the, there's so many ways to look at this, but that is one of the ways that, um, I think makes sense for those of us who really feel that, that there needs to be some, some fairness in who pays the price of our societal, um, habits. Well, how far along in the process, in the legislative process, are we? The bill has been introduced. Is it in committee? Is it the... We've got... It'll be in three committees this year. Right now, it has 66 sponsors, including hmm. five of six Orange County members of Congress. The, okay. only one, the only one in Orange County that hasn't um, endorsed or has sponsored the bill so far is, is Lowenthal, who's in Long Beach. Okay. Um, and I can't speak to as exactly why he hasn't, but the other, Lou Correa, mm -hmm. Cisnero, Gil Cisneros up in uh, Fullerton area, Katie Porter, Mike Levin, Harley Ruda, five of those, all supporters. Wonderful. There are 60, and the funny thing about it is there are 66, 65 of them are Democrats, but the most important person is the Republican that's, mm -hmm. that's on that list. And there'll be more Republicans. The good news is Republicans are working on climate change behind closed doors. Is There's that a, because they have grandchildren? It's more probably because I wish. Of, <laughs> it's pro I don't know why, you know. Um, I, think, I think there is mounting pressure. Oh, there's you definitely know, mounting it, pressure. It, even a year ago, it was easier to ignore climate change. You know, so um, one of the things that, that we've, you know, we're all Orange County people and, you know, Orange County didn't used to have Democratic members of Congress. And so we've been really concerned about how do you um, convince people who are, um, well, Republican representatives to care about the climate. And for me, I always was thinking they needed to know it's a voting issue. And I think that that's really what's happening, that it's it's slowly but surely becoming an issue that politicians can't afford to ignore. And so they look around and the the carbon pricing bill makes a lot of sense. And it's also something that has, um, 
you know, it, it's, it's, it's not a polarizing way to approach climate. It's something where, um, you know, citizens climate lobby and others have really tried to come up with a bill that, um, that has components that are agreeable to most parties. Bipartisan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, our group is bipartisan and that's really, I think one of the strengths because, if if we have a bill that passes through some lopsided process, we've all learned what that means. It won't last. Mm, and yes. so we, we really need to have uh, bipartisan support. We really need to have political will throughout the community, throughout the country, to make this a lasting change. And as Mark was saying, businesses make their decisions based on certainty about what the future is going to be like. And so if they feel that the price of carbon is definitely going up because we've enacted a policy that's going to last, they're going to be making different decisions than if they think it's just a temporary policy. Just like students like Devin who are making their life choices. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you feel like, well, maybe we won't have the worst case scenario, that might take some pressure off you and you might make some different decisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so the bipartisan aspect of this problem is, you know, important and it's important that we have bipartisan solutions. Since we came out with our bill in the beginning of this, this year, it, we actually, it actually came out the last Congress. They, they filed it. It's called a bookmark. Mm -hmm. So they said, this is what we're going to do next year. They filed it last year. There were four Republicans and five Democrats that did it in the last Congress. Mm -hmm. This Congress was redone. Um, back in January. Today, there are five bills that copy our bill mm -hmm. in the sense they're all carbon pricing bills. Oh. They're not as good as ours. Ah, uh, yes. But uh, probably the biggest competition we'll have will be a Republican group. <coughs> but that group has a carbon pricing bill that's very good, except for a couple of things. They don't raise the price year to year enough. Mm. It grows too slowly. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is they want to forgive Exxon and some of the people in the past who misled the United States public mm. by saying that cl climate change wasn't a problem when they knew it was. Mm. So they're trying to get them excused from going to court right. over those issues. That'll never pass Congress, uh, mm. but it'll still, it'll generate some support, mm. which is not all bad. Anytime somebody does something for climate change at this point, it's good news. Yeah, yeah. And we're, we should we're really, thrilled. We yeah. really yeah. should we're say thrilled. thank you mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the Green New Deal. Yeah. Uh, AOC yes. performed a great service. She has used her fame to raise climate change to a whole new issue. It's a whole new, mm -hmm. it was never like this before. Mm -hmm. And after she spoke, yeah. you know, after she got on the soapbox, yeah. Um, I was, we had about 20 of us go over to the Republican convention in Indian Wells three mm -hmm. weeks ago now. Mm -hmm. And we talked to Republicans, young Republicans in those, in those hallways felt the same way almost exactly as we did. They weren't as settled on the science every time, but they all knew we should be doing something about climate change. Those are Republicans that are big enough Republicans. They go to the convention, you know, mm -hmm. those are really case. dedicated Republicans to young people. Mm -hmm. And the older people, not so much. Mm -hmm. So the CCL has been really uh, trying to build its uh, conservative uh, part of the organization. We have um, internships for young conservatives who are wanting to be active in climate change and doing constant outreach mm -hmm. because it's just so critical that we get those voices on board. Yeah. So the, the bills are both in the House of Representatives and the Senate. Last year, there was one in the Senate. It had two members of Republican and Democrats. See, we CCL will only support a bill that's bipartisan. Okay. So we had one last year. Jeff Flake, though, was a Republican. And Jeff Flake was the guy in Arizona. And he resigned. That, that retired. Job. He resigned yeah. mm -hmm. before he got fired <laughs> by the people. Um, now, today, just three weeks, two or three weeks ago, there's a Senate working group. That's like a caucus in the House, but it's called a working group in the Senate. It has a Republican and it has a, a Senate. So uh, it's different than a committee. Different than a committee. Okay. It's a caucus that works behind closed doors and talks about, and they're doing the same thing. In the House, there's a Climate Solution Caucus. It has 22 Republicans and about 40 Democrats on that 
caucus. Mm. And that's where this bill came from. <coughs> the bill came from us, but we also started the caucus four that's years cool. ago. Wow. So we started the caucus. Out of the caucus came the bill. And we're our legislative director is a PhD out of Scripps. His name is Danny Richter. Danny, when you Science talk to Danny, PhD, yeah. <laughs> yeah. he says, what did I say? No, you said out of Scripps, okay. but there's several Scripps. Yeah. <laughs> so he says, I'm just blown away how close their bill is to what we recommended. Mm -hmm. They never expected it to be like we, like we wrote it. Uh, and there are three differences. One favors farmers. One favors the military, and one you're not going to like, maybe. Mm. For 10 years, the EPA loses control over, over greenhouse gases. So in other words, this bill would replace the EPA on greenhouse gases. Mm. It doesn't replace the EPA on anything else. Mm. And they may sound like bad news at first, but listen to this. The EPA has never had any controls on greenhouse gases. It doesn't today, and it never has in the past. And it's not going to tomorrow because it's being wiped out. Well, it's debatable who will be president in the next few months. <laughs> okay. But, yeah. I accept that. The point is... But it's not is, at a strong point at this point, yes. Obama, Obama didn't want to use the EPA. But he couldn't get anything done in Congress. He, his bill didn't pass when he first came into the presidency. So he went to the EPA. It took him six years to get the Clean Power Plan approved. Mm. Because it takes all these different steps for EPA to do stuff. There's all these rules and regulations. And they all require public comments, going back to this. I don't know all the steps. But it, it takes six years. So if you start an EPA process under Trump, that's not going to happen. So the earliest it could start would be under the next Democratic president, let's assume, or maybe a um, a socialist. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Right. <laughs> or an independent. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so there's there are some Democrats that really get upset about the EPA pause in that power, and they tend to be two kinds of people. There's a group of people like Naomi Klein who wrote the book. Uh, is it Naomi Klein? Yeah. Uh, this changes everything. Yes. Yes. At the end of her book, she says a very, I think, foolish thing. She says we have to get rid of capitalism before we can solve climate change. Mm. You think getting climate change is hard? You get rid of capitalism. That's really hard. <laughs> so I think that was a mistake. But there are many people that are good progressive Democrats that I love, the good friends of mine. Mm -hmm. But they're upset about the bill. Because they're so far out that they think capitalism has to go first. They just can't talk about a market solution. Mm. They think you have to do it through the EPA. I mean, through um, subsidies, mm -hmm. through government actions. Mm -hmm. But they fail to understand that if government acts alone in the United States, it doesn't cross international borders. There's no global aspect to it. Mm. Also, as you said, carbon is in so many products that the regulatory um, answer would be, you know, a mess. Because they'd be, you know, are they going to regulate if you use your lawnmower? How much, yeah. how much carbon is in that chair? Right, right. You know? exactly. Yeah. It's just an impossible task. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the other group are, um, there are people that honestly uh, worry about the EPA having any kind of restrictions, thinking it will lead to something else. And I suppose that's a possibility, <laughs> but it seems very remote based on everything we're hearing. Mm -hmm. It's sort of something you do for bipartisanship that you have that EPA pause. But Mark, if the um, the milestones aren't being made during that first ten years, doesn't that change something about the APA's ability to regulate? It forces the legislature to establish controls at a legislative mm. level. Mm. So okay. it's a, <clears throat> so it's out from the executive branch and into the legislative branch. Well. It's legislative for us, and it it would it's legislative for both. But but that there are um, safeguards so that if so the idea is that with the um, the carbon fee is rising over time, and there are certain um, 
milestones in terms of carbon reductions that are supposed to be hit as you go along. Mm -hmm. And so if these are not being made, then there is leeway to, to start regulating um, earlier. And mm -hmm. I think, Mark, did you mention, you know, that basically the, the long-term goal is to reduce carbon by... Um, 90% by 2050. Right. So, so wow. it's an ambitious bill and um, because that's what's needed. And there are these, you know, goalposts along the way to find out if it's working. And if it isn't working, then that's when you can regulate more or in, in, increase the price more steeply. And you're right, Barbara. I was wrong. The EPA really is part of, I guess, the presidential, yeah. part of the executive it's branch. Executive branch yeah. Whereas yes. if you see the, there's legislative controls right now on greenhouse gases. The, 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 the famous one is the auto emission standards. That's was, that's not affected by our bill because it's a legislative action. It was passed the legislature. Um, I should mention another group that you know you young people should know about, especially mm. is the Our Children's Trust. Have you ever heard of it? Sounds familiar. Our Children's Close. Trust is a lawsuit that's that's going to be in the Supreme Court, I think, shortly. Mm. It's already passed the district court once, and. They made it go back to the district court again, and it'll pass the same judge is in charge of it, and they understand. So it's, it's a group of young people suing the government, not for what they haven't done, but what, what they've done. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've heard of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every president and every Congress since Lyndon Johnson has been warned about the dangers of continuing to burn fossil fuel the way we're doing it. This is back to 1963. Wow. And this is by the National Academy of Science, the, mm -hmm. the CIA, the Defense Department, and the Pentagon. Every one of those groups warned repeatedly to every member of Congress ever that served <laughs> since Johnson. And what did Congress do? They ignored it, and they mm -hmm. subsidized fossil fuel. They encouraged fossil fuel. As they were, you know, being told of all these dangers. So um, I give them money every month. I think that's the other group that um, I really support big time. Yeah. Our Children's Trust. Yeah. Uh, I've heard them speak. They spoke at our regional conference, which we have in Southern California in February. It'll be, I think it's the 21st or something. And then we have a national conference in Actually, we have two national ones, but the big one is in June, and then we have a follow-up in November. Um, how many nonprofits bring another profit nonprofit in to to show you know to support them? And we and they spoke at both our regional here locally, and they spoke at our national. And if you if you hear their presentation, you'll think it's a slam dunk. There's just I don't care who's on the court, um, especially with what's happening with the young people right now. Yeah. With Greta. Greta and yeah, I'm, I'm, yes, yes. I'm, I'm wondering if you guys, because you guys had questions for us too, and, and I know that our bill is, you know, really important. You know, that's why we're here. But I'm wondering, did you have questions for us? We didn't have specific questions. They were open-ended questions for you to describe uh, what you're interested in, what, you, what you're doing, what the bill is about, uh, what the carbon tax would be, and so on. So... I'm, I think I'm, I'm, uh, I would like to know, you know, uh, you mentioned Greta Thunberg, yes, and um, she was so impassioned and emotional with her um, speech to the United Nations, yeah, and she really, uh, it really struck me seeing that emotionality. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious as to what got you to be so impassioned with, um, being a part of citizens climate lobby. What, what brought you into this movement? Well, for me, I, I, I think, similar to many people, it's because I also have kids. And so I have three sons and, um, I, you know, I, I am no longer in the day to day trenches of parenting the way I was before. 
and I had time to start worrying about other things. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the thing about climate change is that once you take a dive and learn how dire the situation is, it changes you. Mm -hmm. And I remember that before I really spent time learning about it, I was worried about it. Um, in fact, I actually was looking through my, um, photo albums and I saw that my son, who's now 20, when he was 10, had written one of those things about, you know, that you do all about me, those school things you do in, in elementary school. And one of the things he had about him was worried about climate change. Mm. And so I, I know that it was in the conversation and our thinking back then, but it was still somewhat of a remote concern. And then once I learned about it, and um, that was through the news, but also through Citizens Climate Lobby, and I also did training with um, other groups, um, it radicalizes you, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I don't say that as somebody who is a radical. I mean, right. I just say that to, to my um, horror, really, I just realized that we had a situation that um, I couldn't ignore if I was going to be caring about my children and everybody else's children. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that's really what got me going. And, you know, since then I have, um, talked to my kids about it quite a bit and they're, they're all very, um, climate conscious. And, um, and one day I was, uh, at my house and I had all these climate lobby things around and I was talking to, to my oldest son and he said, you know, well, you know, I'm not going to have children. And I was going, mm -hmm. really? Mm -hmm. And then I, and I knew my youngest one had already made that declaration. And so I said, well, okay, that puts pressure on the middle son. <laughs> and he said, well, he's already said he's not having children. And the part of me just wanted to take all that climate lobby stuff and throw it on the floor. <laughs> Yes. You know, because I'm, I was thinking, well, what am I doing this for? Mm -hmm. But the reality is, um, they don't really know if they'll have children or not. They're still young, but I'm, it's really everybody's children. You know, yes. it's not just my children. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and when I talk to people, um, I think that that is really what I hear most is people saying it's my children, it's my grandchildren, or it's just all the young people out there in the world that deserve better and, and shouldn't be left with a problem that, you know, is going to be almost insolvable yeah. in the next 10 years or so. Right. Um, right. I mean, I, I heard, um, I heard you, Mark say reducing, um, the em emissions by, 90% was it emissions carbon emissions right. yes by 90% by 2050 and i keep hearing 2030 2030 is this you know the ours the bill says it's uh i think it's first at first it was 40% in 12 years but now i think it's uh 60% by 2030 oh good okay. the problem is that each year we delay passing a bill like this it gets pushed back yes and, yes in summer i say this to anybody that talks about this kind of timeline mm. no matter what it is we don't have anything else on the table right there's nothing else i sent you a list of all the people that are supporting carbon pricing mm -hmm. the list includes 70 health groups like the ama yeah you know <laughs> It, uh, there's a million uh, health professionals in another batch of health people that are supporting carbon pricing. I'm a Presbyterian. The Presbyterian Church supports the bill. Mm -hmm. The Church, uh, the United Church of Christ, mm -hmm. the Episcopalians. These are big faith groups. The Unitarian Universalists. The mm -hmm. Unitarian <laughs> Universalists. <laughs> the Evangelical These Lutherans, undoubtedly. Mm -hmm. And and the uh, and the evangelical uh, young evangelical Christians for climate action. Oh wow! Uh, I didn't know about that. Where are they based? You know, there's two names. I'm not actually. There are three names. The there are three names. <laughs> there are three names going to go by. But I just saw them on a on a poll I filled out mm -hmm. today. There's a group of Republicans. It's great if you have some Republican friends you can talk about this stuff with. Mm. It's called Republic In, but it's spelled Republic. E N. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And it's um it's a the the man that's in charge of that group is a former congressman, lost his job because he believed in climate change in South Carolina. That wasn't very popular. Mm -hmm. Now he's 
he just accepted a position on our board, so he'll be on the same board I am. We'll have his our second congressman, uh, Claudia uh, Claudia Schneider is another member of Congress. She was the one that passed the first climate bill ever in Congress way back in 1990. Um, wow. I, um, and you know that's important because I, I think there's a. a a problem for a lot of Republicans or conservatives who are interested in climate change because they don't feel like they have a home. Mm -hmm. And so this group Republican is trying to create at least one landing place for, for conservatives who are interested in climate change. CCL tries to be a place too. Um, but I, I think that that is one of the, the important things about reaching out to conservatives and Republicans and saying, yes, you know, we welcome you and we, we value you because uh, frankly, conservatives are more important right now than progressives because uh, conservatives need to um, kind of embrace the issue and talk to each other because right. that's, you know, that's how trust is built. Yeah. So um, we really need for them to feel like they have a lot of homes inside climate change movements. Mm -hmm. So just to... The point I was trying to make is that carbon pricing is universally accepted right now. There's nobody that comes out and says, do this. Mm. Everybody that comes out and studies it, like the Presbyterian Church used to say divest, but they dropped that. They didn't really drop it. There's still some people that want to divest from fossil fuel. But the church has come aboard and they favored CCL by name. They've done carbon. Our, our, our policy used to be called fee and dividend. Now we just talk the bill. But it's all carbon pricing, carbon pricing, carbon pricing. Uh, the Economist in the Wall Street Journal that was published, the IPC scientist in Korea last October, mm -hmm. for the first time did something no group of scientists has ever done. They said put a price on carbon at the end of their conference in Korea. Mm -hmm. I was so celebrating that because I was so frustrated dealing with scientists. I love them, mm -hmm. but I hate them. Because mm -hmm. they you talk to scientists and they won't tell you what to do. They'll say, we have to do get rid of carbon, but they don't tell you how. Yeah. Well, now the scientists said, put a price on carbon. That was October. Then the economists came out. These were 55 major leaguers in economists, including 27 Nobel laureates, laureates. They said, put a price on carbon. They had five Roman numerals in this article in the Wall Street Journal. All five of those, without any exception, is in our bill. Is in the, is in, the, I should keep saying our bill. It's Energy, <laughs> Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, HR 763. Mm. But you asked the story, I didn't get to answer my, yeah. Yeah. I want to, I want to answer for Marshall Saunders. Marshall Saunders is the, I may cry. I say his name, I start crying. I, Marshall Saunders is the founder of our organization. He worked on world hunger programs for 20 years and received an international award for what he did. Mm -hmm. He was working with microloans in the third world. He was responsible for doing a million microloans in the third world. He watched Al Gore's movie. Wow. He watched it three times in two weeks. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, shit, what am I going to do? All these people I'm helping in so many of the countries I've been working in are going to suffer greatly from this problem. And he went out and he joined Al Gore's group. He became a big presenter for Al Gore's group. And one night he changed 20 light bulbs. You know, 20 people said they're going to change the light bulbs. And that was big news. You know, he was, he was talking. He's a real estate broker in uh, Coronado Island down in San Diego. At the end of the next morning, he wakes up and Exxon was given $3 billion or something, $3 trillion. Who knows? They were given a lot of money. And he said to himself, I'm going to have to do a lot of light bulbs to make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> well, what he did is he worked for Gore for a long time, but then he went to Washington and he looked at this, learn more about the policies. Um, and that's when he started Citizens Climate Lobby. Mm -hmm. And so he followed the exact, the exact pattern of what he had been working with, with a group called Results. And this is a great story. Results changed the United States donation on, on hunger issues from $25 million to $500 million when they were started out. This is in a pretty short amount of time. And the person who gives them credit for that is a guy named uh, Mohammed Youssef, mm -hmm. who won the Nobel Peace Prize. Mm -hmm. 
Well, when I heard this story at the beginning, I said, that's pretty upsetting to me because I used to give money on a regular basis to Bread for the World as a good Methodist in those days. Mm -hmm. Well, Bread for the World didn't get credit for raising the budget. It was results. Mm -hmm. So who's results? Results is a guy named Sam Daly Harris. Mm -hmm. You know what he was doing when he started results? He was a substitute music teacher in Los Angeles, California, mm -hmm. and he was worried about world hunger. He, he would save up his money. He'd buy an airline ticket on Delta Airlines. And he could travel anywhere for like two weeks for $500, something like that. I don't know the exact mm -hmm. numbers. And somehow, and this is the day before everything. This is the day when a phone call costs money. This is the day before everything. This is back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. There was no fax. There was no email. There was no phone. But he would create chapters, people to talk to. And he would fly and go to these cities and meet them somewhere. And he would start chapters of results, mm -hmm. just like we're a chapter of CCO. Mm -hmm. So Sam's Daily Harris is, <laughs> he's an unbelievable guy. Um, and he started results and he did, he's still doing wonderful things there. And now he teaches nonprofits how to do what he does. Mm -hmm. If you have a nonprofit, I'm going to be a veg fest. I'm starting to talk a lot. I told you I talk a lot. <laughs> I'm going to be a veg fest. We're going to table there. We'll table there in about, um, I think it's not this weekend coming up, but the weekend after. Mm -hmm. um, two day event. There'll be a thousand people there. And there'll be so many people that will come up to me and tell me to stop eating meat. Mm -hmm. I don't tell them I am or not. Oh, I just, yeah. they're telling me, you know, I'm always thinking if there could, if you could find a person mm -hmm. who really has an answer to vegetarianism and meat, there is an answer in Congress. Meat gets subsidized by the government. We subsidize the feeding of, of, of grain to feed the cows, mm -hmm. to feed wow. the fat people who eat too much meat. Yeah. Yes. You know? And, and, and it, all, they need, a all they need is a Marshall Saunders or a Sam Daly Harris. Mm -hmm. And they develop a plan and they start working on it. And they could change the world. I really truly believe that the methodology that we use, which is we were in Congress um, in June. And there's, we had meetings with 529 members of Congress. So the question of the day is, how many members of Congress are there? Mm. No one knows the answer, don't worry. No. There's 100 are senators. Are talking about, well, okay. So there's the Senate and the House. Okay. Uh, members no. of Congress. You said the easy you answer. 523? No. Yes. That's approximately We went everyone. to 529. Let's go to, let's go to 700. No, I no, don't know. That's it's 535. Oh. Okay. So we only had six members of Congress yeah. or their staff that didn't meet with us when we went. Wow. We've been doing 500 plus for years. 510, 510. Mm -hmm. This year we're at 529. And that's due to AOC and it's due to our bill. Because wow. now we're a force to be reckoned with. Mm -hmm. So anybody that wants to get involved with climate change, Go to our website, Citizens Climate Lobby, register your support. And then on Wednesday night, every Wednesday night at five o'clock Western uh, Pacific time, mm -hmm. there's an introductory phone call to how we do what we do, our methodology. Mm -hmm. We go to everybody with respect, appreciation, and gratitude. We find something that we're in common with. You know, we will find something to say to Dana Rohrbacher, my old congressman, mm -hmm. that Mine we like. Mm -hmm. And we could do it. Because I, if you go to people, and get to know who they are, you'll always find something you like. Yeah. Dana Rohrbacher is a human being. Mm. Yeah. You know, he's not some gargoyle. He's mm. a human being. I yeah. think that that is one of the, the most appealing things about CCL is that, you know, we really do uh, talk with respect to people, uh, you know, who don't agree with us. Because the idea is that, you know, you can find something to appreciate, but also you're just trying to meet people where they are. Because that's mm -hmm. how you how you talk. Um, I also want to add that one of the reasons I joined CCL is because when you've been involved with various volunteer organizations, you know that a lot of them are not very well organized and they don't really have a good plan. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and and it's very frustrating when you're putting time in and you just feel like you're wasting your time. And CCL is wonderfully organized. And um, if you go to the monthly meeting, which is sort of the 
the primary place where things happen, uh, you not only meet with your uh, local group, but there's a national phone call where people throughout the country, and I'm not sure how the international, around the, around the we all meet at the same time. So, you know, it's, you know, uh, what, 10 o'clock here, but one o'clock on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So we're, it's all at the same time. And um, the national staff always gets on and talks. And then there's always a great speaker who has really got their um, thumb on, on the pulse of some aspect of climate change. It might be the science, or it might be communications, or it might be the politics. Could be um, a science. Could be a, we've had senators, we've had yeah. House representatives. And they're always great. And so we all, so, you know, you, you get at least, you know, a good 30, 40 minutes of really learning something from somebody wow. who knows a lot. And then you kind of meet with your chapter and you figure out, you know, how you're going to go forward. Mm -hmm. And um, sort of the, the, key first place is we all go to our Congress people because we've learned that that's how you make things happen is you've got to show up at your Congress person's office, which we do in a respectful way and, and start trying to assert some influence there. Um, but also we spread out from there too. You're doing tabling, trying to educate people, trying to, to build um, some consensus about climate change. So um, if you really want a group that won't waste your time, uh, Citizens Climate Lobby is, mm. is one to go to. Mm -hmm. And you have, you have a website. And are, are you on social media as well? Do you have a Facebook page? We're or? not, we're not, I don't know if we're very good at that, to be honest. Um, well, we have a, we have a good um, Orange we're County. <laughs> I, well, yeah, I mean, we definitely need uh, smart, savvy people, young people who know about technology to join us. But I have to say, we do now have a good Facebook page for Orange County. Um, and we're on we Twitter. Two, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. And, um, but, but, you know, showing up is really the best thing, but, but you can definitely find us on social media. Okay. So what is your website? Your main website? Citizen, citizensclimatelobby.org. Citizens citizensclimatelobby.org. Okay. Yes. Uh, so it's volunteer based mostly. Yes. Yes. Very we're safe. there are we're some the largest members, flying yes. group in the world. Mm -hmm. Nobody sends more people into Washington to lobby at a single event than we do. Wow. Not the gun people, All volunteers. not the abortion people, oh, nobody. Right. Which astounds me because we pay our own way. Yeah. We. Yeah. I mean, we raise we raise money within our chapter, and we usually send people that need help. This That's year we commitment. send conservatives, mm -hmm. but the people are pretty committed, very committed. <laughs> I think that's very important that, you know, the people who work for advocacy within your group aren't being paid because then it's it's something passionate and something that really, you know, when you, when I think, uh, I'm like trying to think of, uh, let's, Greenpeace, for example, they'll talk about everything except you know, cows and farming and the methane uh, being put up in the air from uh, farming because, you know, they've been paid off by those companies, not to not talk about that. But when you got something like um, a volunteer organization, there's really nothing in the way, right? And, uh, and, and I think what I'm getting at is the people are the strongest and it's really the people that will change stuff. Right. And that's just, that's in the name of the group because it really is about empowering Americans to take control. And one of the, mm -hmm. the basic philosophies is that if you wait for your leaders to lead there, you're never going to go anywhere mm -hmm. that the leadership has to come from the ground up. And so, so uh, it, it really is a great lesson of democracy to be part of the group. And, you know, and, and also it's, it's a great education to, you know, be part of the team that goes and meets with your congressperson, mm -hmm. um, either in the district or in DC. Mm -hmm. yes. So the way people change, um, you know, and help the climate is through politics and economics is what you're saying. Correct? Yes. But I've been, I don't think do it, it's I, I, not. Ex I mean, I think we're in a, everything is needed. Right. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, we, I would never say anything critical against Greenpeace, mm -hmm. Sierra Club or anybody else. Anybody or, yeah. that's doing anything for climate change or technology who are t innovators in technology. I mean, it, it's going to take the whole 
enchilada, right? Yeah. Um, but I think one of the most important things about our group is that we're past thinking that if we grow our own vegetables or turn down the air conditioning, that that's enough. Mm -hmm. it, that it's it's going. That's the political action is because that's required to make the the deep changes mm -hmm. that are required to decarbonize. Right. And it's just fun to turn down the air conditioner and save money and be part of the solution, right? Yeah. You still feel, like I said, I, I, I love to hang my clothes out to dry. I yeah. love the crispy sheets that come off the lawn. <laughs> and riding your bike. That's yeah. pretty good too, yeah. right? Yeah. I'll say this about CCL. And when I say this, it flatters me because I'm a CCLer. Mm -hmm. But you know what CCL is? It's a bunch of nice people that are pretty smart who want to do something. Mm -hmm. We have, we have like 10 PhDs in my chapter, 10 <laughs> PhDs. Wow. And we're not looking for PhDs. It's just that, um, they, and I have a BA. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we have, we have a fireman. We have, we have all sorts of people. But, and so when I say people are, you know, I, I think I'm a smart guy. I know stuff. I went to college <laughs> and I read books and stuff. I still, you know, mm -hmm. so I, that's what I mean. And I think really, honestly, there's a, when you go to Washington, when I go to Washington, I would never not go to the conferences. And you're around, now it's up to 1,500 people to go in June. And you're around this atmosphere of these people that work year-round on this stuff. It's an amazing, energizing force. Mm. It's amazing. And it probably makes you feel as though you're actually affecting change. Yes, we can do all of these things to reduce our own carbon footprint. And you're looking at yourself and you're hoping that you are, um, by choosing to be vegetarian or, um, use reusable water bottles, um, not taking the straw at the restaurant that other people are seeing, right? What you are doing and you're affecting change. But, to be a part of something like Citizens Climate Lobby means you are affecting massive change. You know, those are the little things. People within your little group, you can help them to change their their behaviors on a daily basis. But with Citizens Climate Lobby, it's um, it's bigger, yeah. bigger than you. Yeah, and and it it really helps with the powerlessness that people feel yes. about climate. Yes, because you know you. There is a feeling of, well, I can do my bit, but if nobody mm -hmm. else is doing it, it doesn't really matter. And right. so, uh, you know, I, I think it's actually a great for uh, mental health to be doing yes. something that you feel is, is effective. It provides hope. And, you know, as Devin said, the young people are um, feeling hopeless and you really could, you know, uh, see that with Greta's um, speech, this, that you know, she said, how dare you, you know, take my life from me and my dreams away from me. And, um, and, and I do worry about that because as we know, um, uh, mental health is such, uh, such a, a big deal and can be so affected by, I mean, if, if we really feel the effects of climate change in the future, where mental health issues are going to be really, really um, big because there will be so many diseases in the environment. I mean, just the just the whole, I, I, you know, not to mention just the communities of color and um, uh, and other communities that are in poverty. Um, here and around the world, you know, we, um, we have a lot that will be faced. And I love that the bill, um, talks about really putting the money back, the dividends <coughs> back into the people that don't have the funds to deal with what could happen right in the future with regard to mental health. So. It's a, pro it's a progressive tax, but not by design, just because it happens to be, that poor and middle class people don't burn the carbon. Yes. It's so I'm curious, you're saying so on a macro level, like let's say somebody gets involved with CCL and they're, you know, doing all this stuff. How does like high schoolers get involved? Like the young, young. 
can they join CCL? Yeah, we have yes. high schoolers um, that are members of our chapter, and they're actually um, organizing um, groups. Um, as I'm thinking this, I think some of our high schoolers have now become freshmen in college. But, mm. um, but yes, and um, I, I think they, if high schoolers would find themselves very welcome, and mm. college kids too, and then um, we also will assist them in organizing in their schools. Mm. Mm. Wonderful. At the end of the conference in June, the last night we always have sort of a big party, and uh, and the people that have lobbying for the first time come up to the microphone if they want to, and they say what they felt like. And these young kids come up here, and they're superstars. You know, they're just like they've seen their democracy in action. It's a very empowering thing. Yes. Mm. Yeah, to be a part of that too. I mean, you know, all all high school students have to learn about our American democracy and what better way than to get involved, to get just immerse yourself in really experiencing it. You know, that's, um, uh, as an educator as well, that's, you know, that's really project-based learning, right? Which is really wonderful. And then to be able to go and speak and teach others, that's the highest form of learning. So that's amazing. I, I spoke at two high uh, two two junior high classes um, mm -hmm. in Tustin, um, Tustin, Columbus, mm -hmm. and one was an AP class and one was not. Mm -hmm. The difference is night and day between what an AP class knows. I I worry about this actually because I think when I went to high school everybody was in the same class. You know? Right, right. Now these AP classes are so far ahead of the other mm -hmm. class, even though they've been given the same information by the same very good teacher mm -hmm. who I got to know pretty well. Um, mm -hmm. But it's a tough problem. Um, yeah, it really I'll is. mention two books as long as we're still talking. Yes. I sold over 300 copies of Bill McKibben's book. Bill McKibben wrote, is the founder of 350.org. Yes. You guys know them? Yes. yes. So Bill McKibben wrote Earth, E-A-A-R, it's two A's, E-A-A-R-T-H. Mm -hmm. That's the book I read. Mm -hmm. And up to that point, climate change, I was aware of it, I was, no, it was real, but I just didn't pay attention to it mm -hmm. until I read that book. And I told the city councilwoman when I started working on their thing, and I said, have you read Earth? She says, it's too depressing, Mark. Mm. Um, and it is depressing, but you know the truth of that, the truth of that book? Today, it's wrong in some respects. Only The only mistakes in that book today, this is 2008 book. This is 11 years later, right? 11 years. He underestimated the speed and rapidity and the seriousness of the problem. Mm. That's the only mistake we've made. Wow. Everything else in there is right on. So, mm. we're, and that's, and that's going to continue, I think, to keep mm. happening. That's the danger. Mm -hmm. But the other book I want to mention since we have a psychologist here. Yeah. And we talked about this before we got together with you three. Um, it's a book called Don't Even Think About It. Mm. And it sort of talks about what we're talking about with high school kids. Mm -hmm. But it's true of adults. It's true of college. Yeah. It's a hard, hard problem. It is. We've been lied to by media. Yes. We've been misled in so many ways for so many years. Yeah. And, and it's a remote problem. Uh, it's a long-term problem, and we're in a psychologically and and genetically ill-equipped to deal well with long-term problems. Mm -hmm. Human beings aren't good at that. Yeah. We were raised in the woods. Mm -hmm. We evolved mm -hmm. out of you know hunter-gatherer world, yeah. and and they were taught to to latch latch onto family, mm -hmm. latch onto your tribe. Mm -hmm. Don't look over the right. Mm -hmm. Right, and and so that's why tribalism is really not good for climate change solutions. Yes. You know that that yes. it, it, as long as it's viewed as as something that's owned by you know the Democrats or the progressives or whoever, that's not good for for right. finding real solutions because right. our brains uh, don't like to disagree with their tribes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. true, but when you consider the development of agriculture, there had to be heavy experimentations going on to <clears throat> bring forth the best crops. If you've ever looked at the the history of the development of corn, a maize in uh, Mesoamerica, um, that it developed over years through careful planting techniques and 
cultivation uh, and seed gathering and so on. So, I mean, it was highly experimental, even though it's never referred to that way. Yeah, I, I think that our ingenuity is is something that we have going for us. You know, that that finding solutions is something that we're good at. We just have to be in agreement about the basic facts on the ground you know, that we need to find the solutions. And, exactly. and so, so that's kind of what we're working on. Well, and I think that in America, with American culture, the way it has become, uh, we um, are less interested in um, solving problems, <laughs> which is why problem solving is very big in the education system. Oh, you must know how to solve problems. But... It's not something that we grow up with, I think. And, uh, whereas you find other countries, other cultures, are dealing with big problems and know that they have to be resolved, but then they're also dealing with dictators that we have helped put in place and it makes finding solutions extremely difficult. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that it's kind of, you can easily balloon out into sort of a cultural critique about why we have so much divisiveness and why the media, you know, is telling different pockets of people different information and, and why we can't unify around solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, if you go too far, it kind of takes you away from the feeling of energy, <laughs> you know, yeah, that you need right. to have to yeah. to just keep talking to everybody that you can and to find the words that don't trigger some kind of reaction or mistrust. And, to, you know, that basically we're just going to keep talking and using our ingenuity to figure out how to, to bridge gaps. Well, this is mm -hmm. a very vital model. Uh, mm -hmm. and methodology uh, for getting some things done that, you know, that we can't afford to not do anymore. And I'm really, uh, it's a big relief mm -hmm. <laughs> hearing about this. I hadn't been aware of this particular organization uh, until now. And, um, but I've been very concerned about climate change and uh, hoping for so solutions and um, this is brilliant it's brilliant yeah. and hopeful mm -hmm. i know we need to start wrapping up pretty quick here but let me just say that if you go online and register support for our group you'll get the best newsletter to keep you up to date on what's going on the latest information that comes out of washington because mm -hmm. that's really where it's going to happen mm -hmm. so you'll get two if you sign up online you'll get two welcome emails those will invite you to some stuff we don't raise money online, so we don't. You don't get. Oh, the world's coming to an end. Send us ten dollars. <laughs> yes. We don't do that. Mm -hmm. We raise money twice a year, like any charity has to do. We do it in the spring and fall with a letter, and that's it. So we're not. You're not getting inundated with mail, but you'll get a very good newsletter, and you get two welcome emails, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And if you want to get deeper into it over time, you will. And it, what happens to most people is they, if they do get our mail and they do open it, they do mm -hmm. tend to get hooked on it. Mm -hmm. If someone gives us. I know this from talking to our director of fundraising. Mm -hmm. If someone gives us ten dollars one year, the next year the odds are we'll get twenty, mm -hmm. and it tends to work that way no matter where they start, what level. Can I say one other thing too? Sure. That, that if you do <laughs> decide to show up, volunteer for a job because, as somebody who has joined organizations and not always connected, I've, I've just found that if you raise your hand and say. I'll do something, you know, mm -hmm. that the next thing you know, you actually have a reason to be there and that people are really glad to see you and you have friends. And um, so I'd also say that don't don't just sit back and right. um, watch, mm -hmm. which involved. is something that I have done in the past and try not to do now. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, awesome. this has been been a great uh, podcast, very informative yes. and very hopeful. Um, my voice is running out here. So we're going to have to uh, uh, wrap up. Um, where can they find Citizens Climate Lobby? At what uh, domain? CitizensClimateLobby.org. Dot dot yes. right. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. And you can and then also you can find, find the Facebook groups too. Mm -hmm. Facebook group is just Citizens Climate Lobby, right? And then Probably. you can find chapters to join from oh, your website. The, the yes. website will lead you to chapters. Yes. Okay. If you, so if you just go on the website these days looking for do something about climate change action, You'll find us. Okay. We have three new people in the last two weeks 
And all of them just found us. In your chapter. In our chapter. Yeah, not nationally. Wow. <laughs> no, yeah, three in our chapter. That's great. And they're, okay. all, they're all young. Yeah, they're all young. They're all young. Of course. <laughs> We're going to change things. I'm young. <laughs> okay, Grandma. <laughs> uh, Thanks, you guys. Thanks very yeah. much. Thank you. Yeah. This is a great so conversation. Thank you for yes. being here. It's so wonderful. All wow. right. Like, comment, subscribe, follow on all the social medias. Yes. Uh, you have been listening to The, the Bay 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 Beat. Good night. Good night, Arnold. I wanna wait, wait up, wait up, wait up.